Good luck. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Sydney Atheists. My name is Steve Martin, and I'll be your host for this evening. Our talks cover many areas, including science, technology, psychology, philosophy, religion, and of course, atheism. Tonight we have another special guest in Dr. Anthony Maloof. Anthony's a Sydney-based specialist surgeon. Following completion of training in ophthalmology, he branched into the subspecialty field of corneal transplantation, ophthalmic, plastic, and reconstructive surgery. He has appointments at the Prince of Wales Hospital and Sydney Eye Hospitals, and works in private practice in Sydney. The religious pray for miracles. Doctors like Anthony perform them. No, we don't. No, we don't. Disagree entirely. Don't believe it. Disagree. <laughs> the, the microsurgical suturing required to perform a corneal transplant of the corneal tissue at the front of the eye is truly amazing. No, it's and not. And yet, I'm not sure if Anthony has ever donned a sock. I have. <laughs> Anthony is a fierce proponent of science-based medicine, a strong advocate of science and an equally strong critic of the poor communication that exists between science and the humanities. To discuss what is your doctor really telling you, <laughs> science, pseudoscience and medicine, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Anthony Maloof. Thanks, Steve. Um, just a couple of simple housekeeping stuff. Firstly, thank you all for giving up Friday night to listen to me. I am follow some esteemed speakers. I'm not sure I can uh, be in their company, but I'll do the best I can. Interestingly, I've known Steve for 25 years. 1992, I first met him, and it wasn't at something like this. Um, sorry, louder. I've known Steve since 1992. Wasn't it something like this? Uh, we met in a clinic at Prince of Wales, and. Uh, been in contact ever since. Also here, something interesting tonight is I have one of my teachers and he's come, not from me, but he's come to listen to me and I can't tell you how as a student having a teacher who taught me something that is my profession now, a very subspecialty area, come and listen to me talk is an honour. And I just want to say thank you to Jeff Conn who's here, he's also in Macquarie Street with us, one of my teachers and mentors and was my first insight into rational thinking. And I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it at the time. I've got a bar tab here because I had to write a few thoughts down. So I've got to thank all those teachers. Um, next, Steve rings me last year and says, would you like to give a talk? Because he came to one of my talks and it was about myths in medicine. He said, would you like to give that? And I thought, not a bad idea. So I decided I would prepare it and it took me longer than any other talk I've ever done. This talk has taken me so long to put together and I thought about why. Why does it take a long time? And I thought if it takes me this long to understand my goddamn profession, you've got no hope. And you're going to go there to a doctor. No, joke. one of my surgeons once overseas taught me, he said when they walk to the door they're like fish. And he just did this. He goes, mm, they're gone. And he's right. He's right. So I'll try and explain some of that. Um, Something else that's important to me is I'm saddened that I have to be here amongst you, a rational thinking mob, yet I've been through medical school. I see medical students come in, I say, tell me what you know about evolution. Tell me what you know about the development of the species. Tell me what you know about thinking. Zero, nothing. None of what I learned about this came from my training. And that's very, very sad. So. A lot of this came from people like Jeff and Steve, and also from, I've, been, I've got a side in, I'm writing something at the moment, delving deep into philosophy, and my son and I would talk philosophy, and he's now gone to do philosophy. And so he'll send me his philosophy essays and we'll write, and I'll apply that to medicine, and it's absolutely fascinating, and I wonder why we were never exposed to it. Enough of me um, um, going on. Finally, this thing's flicking. So if it drives you nuts, I apologise, but it'll come back on. So, if I'm taking too long, I'll speed up. If you guys want to ask, stop me, please do. I consider this a conversation. 
So when you go to a doctor, do you go to a charlatan? A stylist is somebody who knows a little bit of science. You know that wanker in the room who just knows one or two little things and thinks he knows more. It's got a name, it's called a stylist. Or do you want a science-based practitioner? Or do you want to go to a private corporation for your medicine? Or do you want to go to a natural therapist? Patients come in and go, I want a natural product. And I go to them, no joke, I say this to my patients and it shocks them. I warn them to show them, I say, feces is natural, but I won't eat it. <laughs> okay? So here you are, a bunch of skeptics. And you guys will think, yeah, yeah, I know I had a question. You can't pull the wool over my eyes, I'm a skeptic. So you question opinions. You don't accept belief. Now, I've got no issue with people having a belief system. Just don't thrust it on me. And if I'm treating you, don't let your belief system interfere with my treatment. And don't try and affect my family or my society and have your belief. I've got my opinions about belief, but you know, if, you, if that makes you feel good, I don't necessarily have to agree or disagree. Just don't let it interfere with me. But what is belief? Thinking things you know that you don't know. Peter Bogosian came here last year, and in his book, it explains that beautifully. Or thinking you have knowledge that you don't. No evidence. So, none of you in this room, me included, know everything. So some of your answers are going to be, I don't know. So why should a doctor be any different? So here you are. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I do need it. Do need it. Oh, hang on. Why are we not projecting? This is the empty game to work. Hold on a second. Come on. Please, please, please. Okay, back again. So questioning is only part of rational thinking. So you question everything, you think, yeah, I'm, I'm a rational thinker, I question. But there's more to it than that. You have to think. So we all talk about questioning, question, I'll ask questions, ask lots of questions, but who teaches you how to think? Sure. Well, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not, thinking is learnt, and that's my point. So. You think you know how to think, but you're full of biases and logical fallacies. We've all encountered it. Have a look at the list of cognitive biases. And we've all heard people say things to people they think they want to hear. The self-deception bias. Patients do it to me all the time. The logical fallacies, familiarise yourself with all of them. This is how you think. But the way I like to think of it is thinking is reactive. We will react instinctively to something. It's heuristics. If you don't know what heuristics is, I'll explain it. And thinking is rational, but rational thinking has to be learned and can be taught. What's all this got to do with medicine? I'll come to it. What's a heuristic? You jump to a conclusion. Classic example of heuristic, Darwinian evolution. Two males in a jungle. The branches are moving. The clever one, the intelligent one who thinks, goes, oh, wonder what that is. The guy that just heuristically think, runs. The clever one goes out and goes, oh, it's a chicken. Fantastic. Well, we'll discuss chickens and we'll work, research it and work out the pattern of the chickens. Next day, the same thing happens. The clever one goes, oh, it doesn't sound like a chicken. What else is it? The reactive guy runs away. The clever guy runs into the bushes and it's a lion. Whose genes get passed on? Okay. We have evolved through, and Darwin pointed this out, evolutionary psychology. Our wiring has adapted the environment. So heuristics are mental shortcuts, and we all do them. You've seen those cartoons, what are the changes in the tooth? 
the more complex the picture, you can't pick the change. Your brain makes assumptions. We make assumptions with thinking. Check a shadow illusion. Look at those two boxes. One looks darker than the other. They're equal shades of grey. Your brain is making an assumption. So belief, this is very important, exploits your reactive thinking and it suspends your rational thinking. That's what it does. So what comes first, belief or knowledge? A really interesting experiment was done. Descartes and Spinoza. Put pressure on a subject. Descartes was wrong. People believe before they know. Very important. And when they know, even if you present facts, they will not unbelieve. And what happens when you, when that happens? They build on that knowledge. They think they know and they build on it. And guess what happens when you try and show them that they're wrong? You trigger the backfire effect, a cognitive bias. You reinforce their belief. Patients do this to me all the time. They come to me with their version of their problem and I'll show them the facts. And a lady come to me with a thing called thyroid disease. Her eyes were getting bigger and bulgier. And she, I, put, I said, you need this treatment. She disappeared. She comes back. She's worse. Why are you back? Well, I'm worse. Why didn't you take the treatment, I said. I was scared, so I went to a natural doctor. Oh. And what they give you? All that sort of shit. And I said, so here's your photo. Here's now. Are you better or worse? I'm worse. Would you consider treatment? And I gave her the line. Feces is natural, but I won't eat it. And so she's off the treatment. Things that are important is people are either convinced or they're not convinced. And I'm going to warn you, doctors will convince you you need a treatment. Okay, because you don't know any better. And advertising makes it sound correct, um, sound convincing. This was wonderful. Yeah, go. A bit louder? I'll tell you, hold it up. This, when I saw this, I thought, wonderful. What a phrase. Belief is the death of reason. I can't work this silly remote. So to be too sceptic, you have to question and you have to think. You can't do one without the other. Thinking's internal. When you stop thinking, you're vulnerable. So when you go to a doctor and go, oh my god, it's a doctor. He told me I have to have this operation, therefore I'm going to have it. Really? Why? But you have to know what questions to ask, and that's the hard bit. Give it one more go. So you've got to ask the right questions and you've got to accept if the doctor says to you, I don't know, he's not an idiot or she's not an idiot, they're telling you the truth. And that's actually a really good thing to be in, I don't know. We are supposed to be science trained. But there comes a point, and I see it all the time, where doctors suspend their science brain and go into their behavioural reactive thinking. And we're very susceptible to non-science, very susceptible. How recent is science? Do you guys, have you guys, when I was at school we had ancient history and I thought, oh my God, ancient history, that's so long ago. And then you think, it was the Stone Age period with ancient history. And the new period is only 1000 BC to 3000 BC, it's nothing. You guys all think medicine is science, it isn't. So here I am a doctor, oh he's a doctor. He's a respected member of society. He does everything right. But you hold me to a higher standard. And you expect that I will come and talk to you and say knowledge and truth and honesty and science and diagnosis and treatment. It doesn't always happen. And I'll explain why. But my opinion is when you go to a doctor, it's the one place on this society where you walk out of our society into reality. You have to. Because if you're going there for social media medicine, and I tell my patients I don't practice social media or medicines, I'm in sale, not in sales, I'm in details, to try and get through to them the importance of it. So when you go, do you expect a company to be driving the doctor? Do you expect the treatment to be based purely on financial gain? Do you expect it to be a social media popularity contest? Or would you be happy with I don't know? So who about me? Who am I to give you this talk? Yes, I've done a few things. People say you're a contrarian, you're a pessimist, you're an optimist, whatever. They love other names. 
Hans Rosling, who just died, and look his videos up, they're absolutely fantastic. He just died, yes he did. He just died a couple of weeks ago. Described being a possibilist, and I really thought that was fantastic, a possibilist. So my area, I mentioned you quickly, I'll show what I do. I like plastic, like reconstructive. There's a couple of gory photos. Does anyone here get put off, vomit, sick, whatever? Anyone, please, it's not wrong to do that. Anyone, you all killed a chicken or something like that? Yes? Okay. So I like my plastic side, my reconstructive side, my transplantation side. It's just what I like to do. So I like that. I look at that and go, fantastic, it's Christmas, I'll repair it and turn them into that, and I think that's wonderful. I really enjoy that, okay? Um, that's a transplant. Dr. Con here took me through my first. There's actually a transplant of tissue on the front of the eye. There's a lot of details. But you see, if I go on tonight, and I'm out there tonight, and on my, I don't have Facebook, on my Facebook page, I go, hey, look, there's Dr. Maloof, and I'm out here, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my patients will go, what? Why am I not allowed to do that? Or that. <laughs> Why can't I put that up on my Facebook page? Right? I can't. Yet I'm a male. I wasn't actually born different from you guys. I wasn't, you know, we're all genetically related. Why am I different? Because I don't have this next to my name. And in society, if I go out and get a DUI on the way home, if I get pulled over for drugs, I am in serious shit. Okay, I just am. So I'm not too fond of that stuff, and yes, my work has carved out some of that niche. My son reminds me, your thinking is so detailed, but your work has done it. Yeah, because I do a lot of microscopic surgery, and I define that as, if 10 microns of tissue makes a difference in my outcome, that's microscopic surgery. So what do I do? It's different, and I keep it quiet. I do that, and that is me, and I love doing it, and I enjoy it immensely. And what's the reaction? Everyone goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> you're an idiot. You're kids. It's dangerous. How do you do that? Why? You're a doctor. You should know better. Blah, blah, blah. Heard it all. Colleagues, if I told them I was taking heroin, they'd probably forgive me for that. Okay? Why? Because they switch off their rational brain, they go on to their reactive thinking, and no one says, why do you do it? Yet I do it, and I actually say, it's an operation, it hones my mind. Because at 280 kilometers an hour, when you have to suddenly get take a corner, switch down 200 and take a corner, you've got to think. And you've got to think quick. And surgeons love to say to the patients, it's all right, no, the risk is minimal. But I always say, who's taking the risk? The surgeon or the patient? The patient takes the risk. I walk away, you died. Well, you know, it happens. Whereas on that, I take the risk. And I find those the really good writers, they talk little and their words are golden and they think. And that's why I do it. So that's me. So this talk came from critical thinking. I didn't learn it in science. Most doctors don't. Science. I ask every medical student, what does science mean? Not one can answer. Not one. To know, scientia, to know. So how do you get knowledge? Have you ever thought about how you get knowledge? Right up close, okay. How do we get knowledge? How do we get it? How do you retain it? You've got kids. How did you teach your kids things? Have you ever thought about that? What we know today has taken a long time, but the science has only been recent. 250 odd years, that's it. We're not that evolved. You get information from science. That information becomes knowledge, and then you turn that into understanding. Science gives us information. That's it. So what's science? This is the best definition I can find of science. I love it. If you don't, if any of you guys have listened to Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, Stephen Novella is wonderful, but basically it's a systematic way for examining our environment and documenting it and applying logic. That's it. What's fact and what's truth? Truth is anything you want to be true. It's not fact. Never, ever confuse them. Now, it's a cartoon. If you've seen the Jesus and Mo strip, I love Jesus and Mo. It's just wonderful. It takes 
Islam and Christianity, put them together and they're arguing over what's fact, etc. Basically, but what if the truth isn't factual? You know, well, don't worry about it, it's still the truth. Uh, it's fa fa wonderfully summarised. But science has to be accurate and it has to be responsible, it has to be support responsibly. And what Steve said in the middle is very something I really, really have a problem with science. It doesn't relate to you guys. So when you go to the shops and you I want to lose weight, I'm going to go on a diet. Forget the fact that a diet is what you eat, not what you don't eat. But let's say you go on a diet and you pick up that can of whatever and it's got 30 milligrams of sodium and 250 kilojoules per 100 mils or whatever the crap is. And you look at it and you think, honest to God, what the hell does that mean? And how am I going to translate that into eating? So you eat it and then you go buy a Mars bar and a Diet Coke, right? We've all done it, but science doesn't write. And the government puts all these stupid things on our things and doesn't explain eating to you. And obesity has climbed in every developing country and not one developing country has it fallen, has the obesity rates fallen. Because science doesn't relate to humanity. A medical degree doesn't confer thinking. Surprise, surprise, you go to your doctor Medical degree doesn't confer thinking. So, I hope I haven't bored you. Let's time travel. History of medicine. It's surprising. Wouldn't we all kill for one of those? I would kill for I really would. We first started writing 6,000 BC. Just think about that. We are 3.4 million years of evolution and written records go back 8,000 years. That's it. To Iraq. Before that, we had fossils and we had to dig up in the stones. We had to, when we write things and search for them, now that bloody thing in your pocket will throw shit at you and it comes to you. That's information, might not be correct. So prehistoric medicine, think about this. What was it? Plants, apothecaries, mixing herbs. That's what it was. There wasn't a doctor. Ancient Egypt, 3,000. They had cures for ailments and they wrote on papyrus. An apothecary is a repository. That's what it is. 2,600 years ago, French apothecary, 15th century. 3,000 years of apothecary. Where was medicine? Babylonia, first handbooks, diagnosis, examination, treatment, Babylonia, 2000 BC. And that's what you do. When you go to a doctor, he'll diagnose you, examine you, sorry, examine you, diagnose you, treat you. 3,000 years ago, that started. India, subspecialties. China, look how long it's taking. Look how long. Acupuncture and herbal medicine still practiced. 3,000, 300 BC. I love Hippocrates. I ask every medical student, taken the Hippocratic Oath? No. Read the Hippocratic Oath? No. Can you spell Hippocrates? He described all sorts of things. So I'm going to show you something that is so relevant today. It is so scary. Here it is. Not that. This, line two, I'm going to read it for you because it is so important. And this is what is the crux of the talk tonight. I will, for the benefit of the sick, apply for benefit of the sick, all measures which are required, avoiding those twin traps of over-treatment and therapeutic nihilism. Over-treatment and therapeutic nihilism. How the fuck did he think of that that long ago? <laughs> You know, all that nihilism in, no value of life, therapeutic nihilism. I just, you know, take this treatment, take it. Why? Because it makes me feel good. You know, corporations drive medicine and they drive it for therapeutic nihilism. Don't ever forget that. So as a sidestep, how many of you guys take more than one pill? It's amazing. I see it all the time and doctors throw them at you. Oh, you got a problem with a pill for that. You've got a problem with a pill for that. Patients come to me and I'm just taking their diagnoses off them and saying to them, I don't know the answer, I'm not going to put this diagnosis on your file. Would you prefer me to put a rock? Would you like the quick answer or the correct answer? Oh, the correct answer. Good. I don't know. Let's find out. 
we have something called the biopsychosocial model of medicine. Bio, biology. Psycho, your brain, social, you around. I'll have a patient in my practice and I want their family in. I want to treat the family. In fact, I recruit the family to treat the patient. It's really important. Psychiatrists practice it, no one else does. So, basically, what if a doctor said, all you have to do is change this? Would you take the treatment? Or would you say, as I've got family members, why don't you get a, why don't you get a medication? Why don't you get a prescription? Because you don't need it. So we don't take the Hippocratic Oath. Alexandria. Then we have anatomy and physiology. Galen, brilliant guy. Galen, anatomy. Describe the four humours. Not much happened. Why? We all know why nothing happened. We won't go there. Look at that. Now medical schools. 1200 <coughs> CE. That's 850 odd years ago. That's it. Right? Eight years training. Padua. First public autopsy. Look at this. Diagnosis was started. Islamic medicine started and they contributed subspecialties. Not long ago, the Renaissance, the Salia started and described the brain and neurology. But look how long ago. It wasn't long ago. Paracelsus started talking about chemicals. We still have that today. And then this guy. This is fascinating. Van Leeuwenhoek demonstrated bacteria with a microscope. Yet how long did it take us to come to the germ theory of disease? Science is not fast. 200 years. He sees them, but it took 200 to go, oh, hang on, these things do things. So we're slow. Dispensaries, 1696, that was what you were given. Age of enlightenment, we love this. We like to talk about it. Suddenly, physicians are coming to age. 300 years ago, less than 300 years ago. That's it, right? Now we've got, we used to have barber surgeons, now surgeons are coming in. 19th century, it's really here that modern medicine started. We are a very, very young discipline, okay? Guy's Hospital, Massachusetts General. The war started. This guy, we all know penicillin. Do you know the story? It's fascinating. Serendipity. Puts agar plates. You're studying staph. Put them on a windowsill. Goes on holidays, comes back. A couple of infected plates are not growing colonies. There's a fungus in it. Works out. Takes him 10 or more years. Creates antibiotic. And then these go... Oh, actually, what happened there? I missed one. No? Look at 1927. This guy, to me, is brilliant. Watson and Crick, yeah, fine. But this guy in 27 worked out that there were two mirroring strands that would replicate. 1927, less than 100 years ago. There they are. So then we've got, this century, technology and computers. It's all happened. PCR, 90s. And CRISPR has only just had it, gene therapies. So this is, we're 200 years old. That's it. So you go to a doctor, just remember his profession's 200 years old. You know, the Romans had copper pipes and plumbing and hot water systems. This is 200 years old. So you guys can eat, you can survive, you can reproduce, but you don't instinctively know medicine. Don't fool yourself, you don't know medicine. So you go there, you're screwed. You are vulnerable. You are going to have to do what they've told you. You're completely reliant on them. I love this. <laughs> I love it. They walk in. I've done my research and I just go, stop. I literally go, stop. And I say, that's medical blasphemy. And they know what I'm saying. Don't hang them. But here's what they mean. Oh, I'm new at this. I've got a little bit of understanding, I think. So I looked at Google, got to the bottom of the first page and thought, yeah, I know everything. 
I've got some unverified information. It fitted in what I think it should fit into. And with this poor foundation for understanding, I've got even worse knowledge now, thank you very much. And that will destabilise everything that I knew before. And now they're screwed even more. Okay? It happens all the time. And then some patients go, oh, I looked at Dr. Google and, you, you know, I don't mind if it reinforces words that I need you to know, but be very careful. Or a patient will come in and go to me, I've got this disease, this problem. And I go, really? How do you know? Oh, well, someone told me and also, would you like me to adopt your diagnosis and give it back to you? Or would you like me to diagnose you? I say it to them. Because it's easy, I'll adopt your diagnosis, write your script and you can go and pay the bill. I say that to them. And they look at me and go, shall we start at the beginning, is what I say. And I've been criticised because that's really harsh, that's the wrong way. I don't give a shit. I am so sick of safe spaces. I cannot stand them. Hitchens said it beautifully, you know, um, I would hate to be offensive by accident. I love that comment from Hitchens. And also, if you're offended, so what? It doesn't mean you're right. You should be, I tell my kids, get offended every day. Offend me, offend. Okay, you don't want to get physically offended, but you want to be offended. You want to challenge yourself. So it's never more relevant. Love this, and really, really important. And this, Mark Twain is one of my heroes, all time heroes, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant writer, but never more relevant than today. So we get it wrong. And I'm going to show you some stuff coming up. And if you know, uh, some anatomy annoys you or blood, I'm sorry, you can turn away in a minute. But look, this is interesting. I used to think this was a doctor's symbol. My father had one, he was a GP. Oh, yeah, it's a doctor, it's a sickle, it's a staff with two snakes, and it's a doctor. And what is it? It's caduceus, Herm Hermes, it's finance. A fat purse. Yet the medical corps put it on their symbols at the insistence of a single doctor, Caduceus, the Greek god of Hermes. That's what a medical symbol is, the rotus clepis. Okay? Medicinal art. What would I what would you say if I said patients die from too much treatment, from over treatment? Would you be shocked? Would it be acceptable? What if it's your mum, your dad, your brother, sister, your uncle, your child? Would you not be upset? What if the doctor went, oh well, you know, it happens. There are drugs that we give you to suppress your immune system. You need this drug, you've got an immune system. They're horrendous. Has anyone here taken an immune suppressant drug or been on one? You have? Make you feel good? makes you feel like shit and it can kill you, all right? There are times when you need it, but it can be oversurprised. This is a guy I've been treating recently and he's about to, I think he's gonna die. He had a nasty fungal infection in his eye socket so bad that last Saturday I had to actually take his whole eye socket out, that's inside of an eye socket, and he's probably got it going into his brain. Why? Because his doctors put him on these combination therapies that, in a controlled start trial, it worked well, hang on. That's a study of a whole lot of people. What happens to the patient is the question. Now, I'm not blaming the doctor, but somewhere we have to stop and go, hang on, there's a person here. So what do we do? Do we tell the patient what happened? Do we tell our other colleagues, say, listen, this person died from this. I published this 10 years ago, it happened again. Do we make up a new diagnosis say, oh, the first patient that I saw with this died and I went and said, oh, they died. What's on the death certificate? Heart attack. No. Send them to anatomical outpatients. That's, patho that's the morgue. And find out. And it was riddled with fungal infection. Yet somebody had written, made up a diagnosis, heart attack. Do we say, oh, well, it happens? No, we need to stop. But, we're, but you guys are lucky in some respects. We are so tightly regulated. Our behaviour control, our prescribing, our privacy, it's tightly regulated. Do we do a better job? Two months ago in a private hospital in Sydney. I'll just go back. 
you're going to be shocked at this. Two Asian patients, non-English speaking, same name. One having a colonoscopy, do you all know what that is? One having a knee replacement. Two months ago, you haven't heard it, it's been hushed. The guy having the knee replacement has got something going up his backside because he's under sedation. He goes, what are you doing? Oh, wrong patient. What happened to the other Mr. XYZ? Oh shit. Too late, the knee's already in. Now, with all that regulation, two months ago, prestigious private hospital here in Sydney. Yet this is Vietnam, and Dr. Con here runs trips in Burma, and I'll bet you the efficiency of these guys, two patients in one operating theatre, and they get through it and they do the work. And you've got to, I sat there and I went back and I said, where's the tea room? No joke, there's a window sill outside with cups on it and a water bottle. I couldn't believe it and I thought, these guys put us to shame with all our regulation. And I'm, I don't know if you'll disagree, but I bet your workers over there. These, Doc Jeff's got uh, AO for his work overseas. AO or AM, I can't remember which one. OAO, there you are. So that was the case I just told you about. Corporate hush up. Is that, is that right? Who should hang for that? I think the doctor should probably be suspended patient should be compensated, the CEO should be fired, and the hospital should be fined. Now, do we behave badly? You bet we do. See anything with stem cells, quantum or nano treatments, and see my patient, oh, is there a stem cell that will fix this? No. You sure? I saw this stem Shut up. <laughs> Love this guy, don't you? The king of woo. Can't stand the man. Watch his YouTube videos. Watch Sam Harris rip him ten assholes. It's fun. <laughs> it's so much fun to watch Sam do that to him. But this guy is an endocrinologist. All right. My area just come out two days ago. I looked and I thought I cannot believe it. You know, stem cells, desperate people. Oh, you're going to make me see. Pay us 10 grand and I'll put a stem cell in. Oh, stem cell, it's going to work. Really? I don't know one stem cell operation that works reliably. So if medical doctors do that, isn't it obvious why people jump to natural and alternative therapies? For me, it's no wonder. It's because the reactive brain says, you guys are untrustworthy, I'm going to go natural. After all, it's natural. And remember, as Winston Churchill says so easily, I'm trying to deal in fact. It takes me so long to explain. And then I explain it to a patient and they'll go, you're unsure, aren't you? Oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm trying to explain it to you. Will listen. And I, honest to God, I walk out some days thinking, why didn't I just medically rape that person and just operate on them, take their money and piss them off? Because to me, it's wrong but I call that medical rape. So patients aren't always immune to it because they've got this social media, this app going, oh, have this and have that. So social media is the light speed halfway around the world and science takes decades. I mean, no wonder the patients are getting sucked into this. And it gets worse. But what isn't regulated medicine? Scientific studies are unregulated. Completely unregulated. I can go home tonight, I shit you not, create a hundred patient series of data on my computer, generate my result, put it together, publish it as an expedited publication, and I promise you I'll have it in press on Monday morning. It's that easy, if I want to do it. And social media is not regulated, and we rely on science to correct itself. Am I speaking loud enough? I'm sorry, I keep... Go. Ah, can I ask you, he's asking questions about peer review. Could I ask you to put that on ice? I'm coming up to it. Okay. Have I lost it? Am I going too slow? Are you guys bored or do you want me to speed up? Okay, question. Um, um, okay, 
Sorry, Steve, I don't know how to fine tune it. All right. Now you go to your doctor. I see this all the time. And your doctor says, I'll oh, come back and see me in three months. When anyone says that, my patient says, I just think, oh, the lease must be due. Or he wants a new boat or car. For that reason, I drive a Toyota. Say so he wants you to do a test. Does the doctor get a kickback from that test? I kid you not, it can happen. He refers you to another doctor. Does Dr. A get a commission from referring to that doctor? If so, would you want to know about it? It happens all the time and you don't know. Why are you getting medication A and not B? Does he own the operating theatre that you're going to? Corporations, let's move on. Corporate influence. Got to love this. I'll at the end of the talk, I'm going to close with this and I'll show you something that I think is very relevant about corporations. So hang in. So they market to us. Just today I'm walking across the snow. I was operating and one of the trainees was, came in and I go, how's Dr. X? Oh, he's good. I said, is he back from overseas yet? Yeah. What's he been doing? Oh, he's been to a, con a conference. Which company's paying for that? Oh, the drug company sent him again. He's constantly overseas. So just think of this. Dr. X is a research doctor. The companies are paying for his research. They send him overseas to present at their conferences and come back, he gets business class airfares. Who do you think designs his studies? Who do you think has an interest in the outcome on that research? I'm not going to answer that for you. So, this is interesting. You know you hear global corporation, oh, we respect human rights. Oh, no, we, we uphold equal rights for women and men and all that sort of stuff. And yes, 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 equal opportunities and blah, blah, blah. You hear all the corporations in America, how minimum wage, blah, blah, blah. Well, change country. And I just find that irks me. Because that irks me, not because she's wearing that, but because of that symbol on the side. It really irks me. But you already knew that corporations only cared about the bottom line of the dollar. Remember that when we talk about corporate medicine. It drives your science and medicine now. Who here is medically insured? It's about 50-50, maybe 60. I don't call them health funds. Why? It's very clever. Who here drives? Who here has driving insurance? Is your driving insurance called a better driving fund? <laughs> no. Why on earth is medical insurance called a health fund? It's got nothing to do with your health. What business gets an automatic 5% increase, two and a half times the CPI, in premiums every year because they lobby the government? What business can reject your payment? My cancer patients will go and their health funds will say, that's cosmetic. And my answer to the patient is, what the fuck? I'll send them your photo. Big hole in the face, cosmetic. How dare they? And they're now buying up doctors and hospitals. So we now have a situation, we have corporations buying up your, your health and buying the hospitals and transferring money between both entities. You are a medium to transfer money. That's all you are. Your health doesn't factor into it. So they influence the patients, you, the doctors, me, research, lobby, drug developments. They, d they muscle the government to get, say what drugs you will get. When I was running a department at Westmead Hospital, one of the corporates came to me and said, will you use our prosthetic device? And if you do, I'll give you this equipment and you can put it in your rooms. Get the fuck out of my face. I could not, it made me so angry. How dare you do that? If your, I said, if your product's good, I'll use it. If it's shit, take it out of here. But I couldn't believe they had the gall to do that to me. Maybe I'm the dummy, because everyone else seems to be doing it. Um, in the corporate financials. That's how what? It's 
it's com would you agree with it? I wouldn't agree with it. I know why it happens that way. But do you think it is right when it comes to health? No. no. It, it, it's more expensive. Um, I understand. But what I'm getting at is if you don't think it's right and you understand that corporates are driving it because hospitals want money so they're bringing corporates in yes. to determine my practice that affects you because you're a medium for transferring money, is that medicine? No. Do I want to be treated like that? Yes. No way. I understand it is. So at the end, I will cap that off and explain what's happening. So why is our education expenses in corporate financials under marketing? When they go and teach doctors, it's marketing. Let's go to medicines. Don't you love it? Just, you know, you little rat bag kid. No, go and take this. Advertising. This. When the patient lashes out, sure, just hit him with an antipsychotic. Take this. Look how terrible he is, you know. Look at this guy down here. Give him an antipsychotic. Well, this, look at the imagery. Won some Hall of Fame award. So you can go and take these antipsychotic medications. Really powerful. I hate this. Who have you been to? How many of you have been to the US? Haven't you flicked on the telly? Have you got wrestlers legs? You got this, go cast your dog with this. Shut the my sister lives in now and she'll come out and go, I need to get vitamins, Jane, shut, and she's a doctor. You're an idiot. You are hypochondriac. Stop it. Oh, no, no. And it's because of this. Ask your doctor for. How the hell would you know what to ask your doctor for? Seriously. This is so sick that I've just got to get rid of it. This pisses me off. How you can get medications from your doctor. There it is. Go and do this, that and the other. So what's this called? Direct to consumer advertising. It's well recognized. Sure, it's a recognized business thing, but it is wrong. Why? Because we're reactive thinkers. We can't fucking think about this stuff. We can't. It works too. Study show it works beautifully. Higher prescribing volume and competing effects on treatment. What can you do? Remember that? What's the difference? This. <laughs> My son rings me after ENT surgery and goes, Dad, I talk to you and I'm having all these weird dreams. I feel like I'm going to... Stop it. Just don't take it. To one. Powerful stuff. That is scary. And I'll show you why in a second. This really shits me because I go on <laughs> coming back, getting all excited. Damn it, it'll come in in a minute. Come on, find it. Hang on. If there's any questions, go now. <coughs> Don't know it. Don't know, know Edgy. Sorry, he asked a company called Edgy. Don't know it. I, I don't have a tele. I have a television in my house. It doesn't go on. I have a BlackBerry. Who here has a BlackBerry? <laughs> I run a BlackBerry because when I go into my web browser, I don't get fucking ads. I don't get told what to do. I to ask it what to do. It does it, and I switch it off. I can't stand it. This I hate. I hate this. You know, punching, oh, I did my medical diagnosis. Um, that patient I showed you, whose eye socket I took out, we scanned four times. Other doctors did him. Patient, my registrar's ringing me. It wasn't until I sat at the end of the bed and examined him that I went, no, this is, I had all these thoughts. No, it's not that, it's this. I had to look at him. What is hypochondriasis? You've all used it. It's actually a term for below your rib cage, because that's where the source of melancholy was supposed to origi originate. An ancient word, we all use it, most of us don't think about the etymology. You need to think about it. This, look at this. If you gave me a drug that reduced my risk of heart attack by 36%, yeah, I'd take it. But it doesn't. It reduces your relative risk. But the average person can look at it and go, oh, it's fantastic, I'll take it. They got reprimanded. Love this. Very, very important. But even better is that. I just <laughs> love it. I want to put that in my waiting room.
Instead, why don't patients say, well, what's my diagnosis? You know what? I don't know, but guess what? We'll find out. That man, when he was in his bed, I said to them, actually, one of the other consultants goes to me, it's not that fungal infection. I said, it could be. It's not. So what are you going to do? I went, no joke. This is a, a guy that's 15 years senior to me. Twice. What are you going to do? I'm going to diagnose him. Well, it's not mucor. So what are you going to do? I'm going to diagnose him. And I couldn't stand it. This guy thought he would just ramp. And guess what? I was right. So it wasn't that I was right. It's that he was so arrogant, he didn't think about it. Why don't patients ask, what's my diagnosis? Do I need this test? Do I need these drugs? A mate of mine just came to me the other day. He's 38. He's got hip problems. So I said, just do an x-ray. He did an x-ray. I pulled up and went, look, I don't like that. We'll do a scan. He did a scan. I said, look, you know what? Now it's time to see an ortho. He went to see an ortho. And I know a good one. Sent him and said, look, you know what? Yes, that's the problem, but we can take it easy for a while and just do something simple. Fantastic. If other guys would have gone, oh, you need a hip replacement. 38. We are all susceptible to powerful imagery. I don't care what it is. If I put you in an environment long enough, I can convince you the sun is the moon. It will happen. You're screwed. It's going to happen. So we are now in that environment, except it comes through that thing called a dumb phone. And it's changing your environment. OK? So does anyone know that date, 29th of June, 2007? You will in a minute. Who what? iPhone. Thank you, Jeff. Steve Jobs got on stage and says, every now and again, something comes on that changes the world. He wasn't fucking kidding, but he didn't know that that thing has changed the generations forever. Look at Aliens. Have you worked with Aliens? I love it. I pull out these movies. They had everything, but there wasn't a touch screen. It's fascinating. Arthur C. Clarke, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Fascinating. They had, no joke, beautifully laid out meals. They had a tablet, but it wasn't touch screen. Fascinating. Corporate health. They control you, me, meetings, sponsorship, protocols. Why don't doctors just bend over? I'm telling you, it just really. <laughs> Medical insurance and your hospital. They're basically shifting money from one pocket to the next. Where's the science? Corporations sit at the top. The science has been shifted. And doctors have become sheeple. I'm not negative. This is real. So we've been influenced now by our dumb phones. So we had this three category, you know, the, the working class, the middle class, and the rich. Now we've got the reactionaries, the guys that pick up the phone and go, oh my god, look at all those 10 cats. Aren't they so cute? Oh my god, I've got to get that natural therapy, blah, blah, blah. And the guys go and watch us fuck the whole country and rig the election and just take out and put, a, put an idiot in charge of the presidency. Watch us do it right now. It just happened. We lived through a quiet revolution. Okay? And doctor's part of that. So, I call it sort of, it's like corporate GPS. They'll just guide you where they want you to go. So we are human, we have biases, we can be misled, we fail our training, our training fails us. Sometimes very, very badly. That's not acceptable by anyone's standards. But for a medical professional, should he be held to a higher responsibility? No, that's just unacceptable. The fact that he's a doctor is separate. Doctors have dissonance. I have a sister that's maxillofacial trained and is the most irrational person I've ever met in my life. I can't talk to her. Total dissonance. But if you think my sister's bad, <laughs> this guy, I have no words for. I can't. He is can't. an economist. <laughs> ben Carson. Who on earth would put that on the internet? Ben and Jesus in bathrobes. <laughs> right? Who would do that? Honestly, the arrogance of a wanker that would do that. God talks to me because I'm a neurosurgeon. 
he's, yeah, he's a tool, that's what he is. It's not God, it's Jesus. Son of God, let's not get into semantics. Friends, when I was training, have you ever heard of chronic fatigue syndrome? Yeah. No shit. I was in an immunology clinic and every patient had chronic fatigue. And the prof that was there at the time is still there now and he diagnoses everyone with every immunological disease. And I think, this guy's bullshitting. He wants to get off work and claim compo. I can't work. I'm like, now look. If you have a viral infection that affects your brain and you get a meningoencephalitis, it can really screw you. The problem with these things is they really do disservice the people that are suffering truly. It's real. You could get it, you could die from it. But in the 1990s, depending on which articles, up to 3% incidence of this, you're shitting me. When it goes out of fashion, oh, wow. What? Is it contagious? Bullshit. It was just so overdiagnosed. Everyone had chronic fatigue. It's almost gone. So is it fake? We got fake news. Why not fake diagnoses? You know? Is it trendy? Is it incorrect? There's no laboratory test. I'm reliant on a symptom. Patients come to me and go, oh, there's pain around here and it goes there and there. What is it? I don't fucking know. I say to them, I cannot see your pain. And they look, oh, I cannot measure your pain. Pain is subjective. We'll try and find a cause, but I may not be able to answer you. So what kind of a doctor are you? Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> that is exactly right. You mean you don't know, or you're not certain? No, I'm giving you the correct answer. Would you like the quick answer or the correct answer? It's exactly what it is. Why do we give a diagnosis? But I've got a viral problem. It's a garbage bin diagnosis is my answer to the patient. That's a garbage bin diagnosis. If I can prove it, I will. If I can't, I'll give you that if you want to take it, but I can't give you medication because it's viral. You mean you can't give me a prescription? No. Okay. They want a prescription. You've got to decide. What do you want to hear? Patients don't like it. Social media. You must people here must have walked by a coffee shop. You've observed four people around a table and everyone on their goddamn dumb phones. You've observed them message each other. Ha ah, ha I got it. Ha ah. You go to the Greek plateas and everyone's having a coffee and chatting. What happened to that? The conversation, the inspiration, the ideas, the idleness. It's wonderful. No, it's dead. So we have these quick apps. And no joke, doctors go and create a quick app, okay, to help work out when to discharge a patient and they validate it against a clinical, a clinical assessment of the patient. Why don't you fucking just assess the patient? What do I need to use an app to help me assess the patient when it's validated against my abilities to assess the patient? I don't understand it. But no, we've got this app, we've done research and made this app, so what? Anyway, then there's clickbait. Does anyone here use Bing? Do you? Yeah, I have Microsoft, so Bing comes up and I go to Google, but I love looking at Bing because it's so shit, right? <laughs> it is so shit. And there's boobs hanging out here and this here, and every now and again I just go, let's just have a look, and it's the same show. What the fuck did I do that for, right? Why did I fall in the same trap? You fall into it. It's got a set of boobs on it, so you fall into it, right? And women click on it too, so don't give me that shit. <laughs> clickbait science. This is what clickbait is. It's a feature designed to track your attention. Why? Because we are sentient beings and we demand stimulus. Our evolution has geared us for stimulus. You're walking in that jungle. Have any of you ever been stranded? Been stuck somewhere. I, I, yeah, so you have. I rode my bike off in the bushes and got stranded. Like, oh fuck. I looked at my tank. I've only got a little bit of fuel. Hat wet, nothing on me. No phone, nothing. Stranded. It's like, and boy, do your senses go through the roof. I went camping up to northern Australia in July last last year, and it's amazing. There's nothing around. Not a person. We had to actually boat in there. And I tell you what, you go to sleep at night. And a 
a cricket farts and you're alert in no time flat and you're being, your eyes awake, it's like, you know, sensing it, okay, fine, boom, straight back to sleep. It's phenomenal how you do that. And we're all, we're all done for that. So, clickbait. What do we go for? Sex, money, material possessions. Earn a Ferrari in a week. Blah, blah, this guy built 10 properties in one year and blah, blah, blah. You've seen it all. Note the promise of a cure. You've all heard of Belle Gibson. Right? She should be publicly executed, in my opinion. But she's at it again. For some reason, this picture didn't come out. It's not on my screen. I don't know why. Did you see this article? Yeah. Recently. Yeah. Wow. Woolly mammoths being... Oh, come on. DNA doesn't survive like that. But that was it. And they all had it. Woolly mammoths are coming back. We're in planet it's Asia. Jurassic Park? Of course it does. <laughs> Great sci-fi. Never happened. DNA doesn't last that long. Right? It's only 20,000 odd years, but it's, it, doesn't, it could survive it, but it hasn't. So, there's another one. The Guardian. What are we coming to? Seriously, come on. That's fine, but that's not what we're saying. They found parts of it. Would you believe in the 53 or 54 in US, they actually had one of the dinners in the American Natural History Museum and they had woolly mammoth meat on the menu. Look it up. Okay, so yes, they've not only found them, they've found the meat. So, it was very expensive, apparently. <laughs> um, what they said was, look, there's two years away. That's it, there you love it. We're just two years away. Who actually goes back and goes, hmm, what did they say? Let's see where they're up to. No one, I just say it. Like Trump. Oh, I've been tapped by Obama. Go and, go and investigate. Where's your evidence? Go and investigate, I've said it. It's, that's real, that's all you need. People could say anything in two years, in five years away. Who cares? I don't want to hear about it. But we hear this. Well, what really happened? They sequenced a couple of DNAs and they were going to inject them in. That's it. So, we should, social media should inform you. But what does it do? What do we use social media for? You're going to be shocked at this. Oh, social media is there to educate the patients. Bullshit. I was a consultant when this guy was in the theatre next to me doing boob reductions. And I used to wonder, why are you constantly, geez, you're doing a lot of boob reductions. He was trying to get himself prepped for when he was going to come out and be the world's best plastic surgeon boob reconstruction guy. Snapchat takes everything to a whole new level as far as educating the patient. Bullshit. Takes things to a whole new level because this week I'm going to show 10 boob jobs and next week I'm going to show 12 boob jobs and I'm the best boob job doctor in the world. That's what he's saying. Look at that woman up, the nurse there, taking the Snapchat video of the boot. I mean, come on. That's voyeurism gone extreme. So, everything is there. Clickbait, social media, fake news. I'm going to... We'll have a break? Okay. Um, let's go through. Uh, very quickly, this is something. James Randi. Wonderful. And... This I love. We are bamboozled by everything, okay? We're just bamboozled, and we don't know science and technology is bamboozledness, and suddenly we're lost. Let's have a break and come back. You happy if I keep going? I'm going to get going. If you guys have to go, by all means go. I'm going to crack on and I'm going to pick up the pace because I want to get you guys out of here. I'm going to move quick. So, social media medicine, myth and fear. What do we fear? Cancer and, of course, vaccines. Let's move on. Medical conspiracy, that's what it is. Medical conspiracy. And these guys, if you haven't heard, the Australian <laughs> Vaccination Network. Yes. Told, yeah, 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 I know. It, what arrogance, right? 
It's not anti-vaccination, nor we're pro-vaccination, we're pro-choice. Let the people decide, as if the people fucking know, right? <laughs> and look at this, they link themselves to natural therapies, and then it declares doctors are terrorists, and then of course you've got these wankers, they want to take your flu right out, and they're in the Western Australian electorate, but they only got 600 votes, which is fantastic. <laughs> And then you got this dickhead, the king dickhead that exists in the world in medicine. If you haven't heard of him, it got published in the most prestigious journal in 1998, Vaccination. Andrew, wonderful guy, good on you. You wanted fame, you got it. And what did he do? He published a fake paper. There was an immediate outcry, oh, vaccines give you autism. And then that starts. You've got to be a dick if you don't find that distressing. And so what happens? They did further studies, couldn't prove the link. Ten out of twelve guys retracted in 2004, published in 1998. What did the doctors do? A journalist investigated it. A journalist. Ryan Deere. It took 12 years for The Lancet to withdraw it, to retract it, and The Lancet didn't. Doctors, the science didn't catch up to itself. A journalist did. And guess what's happening in the world today? Yes, he was struck off. We're losing our journalists, aren't we? So, science failed us. The journalist exposed the deception. And now we don't have investigative journalists because we have Google News, and we have Facebook News, and we have social media news. Great. This is wonderful. Never forget it. I'll give you a chance to read it, but I'll read it. Finding the occasional straw of truth in a great ocean of confusal and bamboozle requires intelligence, vigilance, dedication, and courage. If we don't practice these tough habits of thought, we cannot hope to solve the truly serious problems that face us. And we risk becoming a nation of suckers up for grabs by the next charlatan who comes along, who is Trump. <laughs> Do you know her? Yeah. Thank you. Borat, US and A. Love him. Jenny, oh, my beautiful son. I'm a Playboy model. I can get what I want. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, he's got autism. And he had a vaccine. Must be the link. And of course, this goo dude jumps on the bandwagon and sends that crap out. And then Hillary. I can't say God bless her, but she tried. Um, she's right. And then this idiot. <coughs> Everyone in this body, in this room, has human papillomavirus on their body. Get used to it. It's not a sexually transmitted disease. We give it now, the vaccine, to young girls and boys because uterine cancer will kill women. And if we can stop it, we eliminate cancer. Remember polio? What did we do? Well, it's a vaccine. Gardasil 9 is out. I'm about to get it. You should all get it. Shingles vaccine. If you love that, don't worry about it. But if you're over 70, consider it. So social media is a tool, and unfortunately, doctors are influenced by it. And can people decide no case in point? Was Brexit? Let the public decide. What was the number one search? What's the EU? <laughs> Oh, I'll just tick no. Let's leave it. Oh, great, informed decision, that one. Why can't we have elite thinkers? Uh, you all want to go to the best surgeon, the best doctor. Why can't we have elite thinkers? Because we're idiots going through safe spaces at the moment. So we live in a developed world. Our thinking, we are 100,000 year old species running 21st century software. We can't cope. We're regressing as we're progressing, and we're going backwards. It affects your patients. Doctors will not change that. We are the last people to change it. It'll come from philosophers and artists. So in the medical consult, we ask you questions. You tell me your symptoms. You got a headache? Where's your headache when you get it? Blah, 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 blah. We assess you. We formulate a diagnosis. I suggest tests to confirm my diagnosis or to measure things. Okay? I recommend a treatment, I refer if necessary, and then I follow you up. That's how it works. What if I just want to take a sickie? What's that? What if I just want to take a sickie? Is that work? Then I've got to try and suck you, work you out and say no. 
Patients go, can I have another week off after surgery? No, you don't need it. So, why are you giving that medication? Why are you having the tests? This, you ask me what to ask. Well, why do I need my blood pressure medication? Well, if you follow, if you, let's see how you can modify your diet, lose a bit of weight, and blood pressure will fall. Your sugars will get better. We all know that. How do you do it? That's difficult. Or I can give you a pill, and then I'll give you another pill, and then another pill to check the side effects of the first and second pills. So, we use fear. Don't take this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and you've you got no idea. Whereas I find this funny. I didn't ask you to undress so I can examine you. I asked you to undress because it's essential to a doctor-patient relationship that I'd be fully clothed and you'd be sitting there in your underwear. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Medications, antibiotics, overprescribed. Alexander Fleming predicted that. The public will demand the drug and will be a, begin an era of abuses. What a legend. Doctors get it wrong, 30 to 50%. Antidepressants, I hate it when I get 25 year olds, what are you on? And they name antidepressants. And honest to God, I want to take my rage out and go, what the fuck are you on an antidepressant for? Go on for a walk in the country, go and meet some people, go and have coffee, go to the gym, do something, do art, do some reading, get off your antidepressants. Get a dog. Get a dog, for God's sake. But doctors know how to do it. No. Don't you remember that? Mama's little helper, your little yellow pill. So, bang. It's up. So we overprescribe. We give you all this stuff to make you feel better. But this is what shits me. What's the number one gateway drug to heroin in the US? Marijuana? Oh, it's a dangerous drug. Ooh. No, it's doctors. It's doctors. And if you want to go home, go and Google John Oliver, his little episode on opioids. If you haven't seen it, it's brilliant. Research. Most research is negative. I think this is going to happen. I'm absolutely certain. Guess what? 95% of the time, I'm going to be wrong. Because heuristics <coughs> make it obvious, and it's wrong. Why are our thoughts so, when we have a breakthrough, why is it so often out of left field? Oh, it's not what I would have thought. Why? Because we've evolved in this space. We can think from here to there. We're not evolved to solve the very, very small or the very, very big. We can't think that way. Can you picture one trillion miles? I can't. So we can't. That's why these things, um, research, when it finally reveals something, is so, wow, who would have thought? No, because we can't think like that. Medical research is now run by companies. Companies generate, oh, this is interesting. They invest in the drug. They want to prove it works. They design a study. Doctor, you are going to be a very famous doctor. We're going to get a lot of money. We want you to do this study. You've got a lot of patients. How about we will fly you here and blah, 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 and you'll be here. And then we'll give you a talk. We'll write it. And then you'll be the noted speaker throughout the world, and you'll be an eminent lecturer, and you'll be a recognised expert, and you'll get more money. Medical prostitution is what I call that. So it dominates doctors, a lot of doctors who'll do it. They fund our research, and then they fund our trips, and then we give them favourable outcomes, and then the medication gets approved, and then we prescribe it. That's how it happens. And most doctors don't know the first thing about statistics. So we read the paper and go, ooh, it's effective. I better use it. All right? We're a mob mentality. We follow everyone else. Corporate research is here to stay. It's increasing. Nutrition is wonderful. Nutrition research, whatever the research, tends to have a favourable outcome. We, in this country, thank God we have tighter laws. But where there's no drugs, there's no laws. And that's why all these things are popular. People can take them. Homeopathy, we all know about. NHNMRC shows it's a placebo. We've been there before, big tobacco and food. Let's move on. Remember this. There's a, I can tell you there's no black swans. I can show you a million black swans. I can show you there's 10 million black swans. I can show you a bit, sorry. 
white swans. I can show you there's a billion white swans. That doesn't disprove the existence of a black swan. You can show me one black swan. And that's the asymmetry of proof. You can't disprove those. So Einstein said it. You've got to ask the harsh questions. Why am I on the treatment? Who funded this research? You're telling me research. And then we've got to ask, is research valid? And most of us don't do that. As I said, he could be referring you, treating you, operating on you for, fun, for money. We love to convey fear. If you don't do this, you think it's going to happen. If you don't take this tablet, you could die, blah, blah. Is there another way? Is what you have to ask. So we uh, influence you to take something, <clears throat> and we promote the treatment. I'm going to shock you with this. This patient could see beautifully, perfectly well, 20-20 vision. Didn't want to wear reading glasses. Oh, I'm a really good doctor. I'll fix it. I've got a cure for you. I'll fix it. I'll do an operation in your eye. I'll put a lens in your eye. You won't have to use glasses independently. You know, never have to use glasses. Patient goes into surgery, comes out, has half his iris ripped out, has his lens ripped out, can't see, the cornea has failed, and the doctor tells him, hardest operation. I looked at him, he ripped your iris out. What really happened? A drug rep was in theatre, had the video, and suddenly I got sent the video, because it was a legal case and I was involved. Surgeon one screwed up, ripped out, lied, told the patient, oh, I've been up all night thinking of the best person to send you to, and I found him. Guess what? He was under the same corporate umbrella in corporate medicine, so he sends him to his mate in another building. Same corporate umbrella, lies to the patient, and the patient goes, hang on a minute, whoa. So we could pray in heaps, heaps, heaps of doctors. Guess what? More, more, more doctors. Less and less surgical experience. If all you've got is one operation, one hammer, everything's a nail. And so there's a lot of doctors out there. And, but this guy's brilliant. He's in Liverpool, Ian Harris. Basically, he's the guy that said, arthroscopy is a load of shit and got the arthroscopy number off. That's where they stick a scope in your joint. People going back and have a scope in the joint 10 times. And he said, this is rubbish. It does nothing. We need some evidence. He got it thrown off. He'll probably be hated by his colleagues. And then he went and wrote a book, Surgery, the Greatest Placebo. <laughs> what do you mean, ooh, that's chicken guts and a guy's holding him over someone's belly, pretending to take out a tumour? My comment is, are we becoming like that? We have myths. There's a lot of myths. Myths is faulty thinking. I'm going to stick, skip a bit of this. Um, remember, we used to think the sun, or the earth is at the centre of the world. 1543, the year of his death, he had to publish it. Galileo got blocked up because he said it was true. It took ages to agree that, that the earth, that we're not geocentric. Medicine is full of myths. I get taught myths, and I love telling the students and the researchers that's crap. It's called medical mythology, and I'll explain why. And we pass them on. Just because you get a university degree doesn't mean you're a myth, you can actually bust through them. I call them myth viruses. They spread. And this is what Robert Ingersoll. Really true. How you advance from it depends on how you give up your myth and substitute it for truth or fact. I would change it to fact. How do they happen? I speak to a mate and a colleague in a corridor. He tells me something. Oh, yeah, really, that sounds real. Oh, must be this. HRT was the elixir of life for women. Take HRT, you'll stay young forever and cure cancer. Absolute low crap, didn't work. Butter is bad in the 60s. Why did we get low fat? 50 year study showed butter made no difference in fat or mortality. Right? I'm gonna show you predatory publishing. You asked me about science before and proofing. Predatory open access publishing. This is phenomenal. With the advent of social media, 7th of March, I get an email overnight. Couldn't believe it. Oh, Dr. Malou, submit your paper to us. And by the way, if you want to be a referee as well, you can be a referee. So, and we'll publish it. And then you get a reply. Pay us a thousand euro. Okay? So I, that shitty paper I told you I can put together tonight, I can have in press Monday morning. Beagle's criteria goes through the Peripathy Publishers. And guess what? In 2011, there were 18. There's now 923 as of last year. And rising, that's exponential. 
It means I could have 100 papers and I could be an associate professor, a full professor. Look at me, I'm published. Bullshit. Scientific white noise. So we're trying to make decisions and all we have is noise. There is hope. The Cochrane Review goes through and actually goes through very systematically a proper peer review to try and find what really works. And just remember, simple, the movement of a whisker and a cat is so complicated at a neurological level. Simple has a complex basis. Don't oversimplify because that's the job of social media, not of medicine. Oversimplification is dangerous and Einstein said it beautifully. So social media, to me, is the champion of oversimplification. And wisdom is important. I love this. I tell my patients all the time. The object in this life of my, actually my trainees is not to be on the side of the majority, but to escape finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. I love it, love it, love it. And, Vi and Richard Feynman. I love him. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. We live in social media medicine. I was going to have a break, then we'll move on. There are a few myths in my area, but I don't know if I'm going to go through all of them, but I'm going to, sk I'm going to skip through two and go to one. We have a treatment called, ignore that. OK, there's a condition where you have a, a lens of the eye, and the lens is bent out of shape. It's called keratoconus. Kera, cornea, conus, conical. Looks like that. See, it's bent out of shape. Right, and we tell the patient, oh, your cornea is weak, bent out of shape, you can't see, it's blurry, blah, 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 blah. So we've got this new whiz bang treatment, it's called collagen cross-linking, and it's going to strengthen your cornea and cure your keratoconus. That's no shit, that's what every colleague says, it's in the literature. So you think, wow. That's what it looks like, you shine a light on it, UV light, and that's like looking at the sun. Oh, we tell people it strengthens your cornea and the shape's going to get better and you'll see. Sure. It's like looking at the sunlight for 1800 seconds, peak sun. Don't do it. But that's what we're doing to the patient. And we try and sell it to everyone. But what does the science say? It causes a whole lot of problems. I'm not <coughs> going to go through them. I'm going to rush through them. A whole lot of problems. It thins its scars. I'm going to show you a picture of scarring. There's a scar right in the middle of the cornea. So you're looking through a scar. I did that to a patient with this treatment. More, more, lots of scars. What do we say? We say it'll strengthen it and fix you and improve your vision. So we claim it will strengthen it. There's not one study that proves it. Not one. But we sell it. And what's more, the Cochrane Review shows it's full of biases. All the studies are full of performance bias, detection bias, attrition bias, publication. That is, you'll publish what you can get published irrespective. We do that. So what are we doing? Who the shit cares? It sounds good. The patients will buy it. They can't see it. They've got no idea. I make money. Got a new lease. Sell it. And the patient reads, here are stories about guys getting sight back. This guy is saying, any patient can be treated. And Australia is saying, prevent the need for a transplant. This one saying, new hope, new hope. So, you know, we do it. Love this. This is a wonderful paper on the reception and detection of pseudo profound bullshit. <laughs> and this says, wonderful. Those more receptive bullshit are less reflective, less reflective, lower in cognitive function, <laughs> cognitive ability, more prone to ontological confusions, that is, theoretical, basically, uh, theoretical analyses that, that sound bamboozling, and conspiratorial ideation, more likely to hold religious and paranormal beliefs, and more likely to endorse complementary and alternative medicine. That's about right. Bullshit is a consequential aspect of the human condition. With, indeed, with the rise of communication technology, people are, more, are likely encountering more bullshit in their everyday lives than ever before. Social media, state of play, we generate the hype, we sell it, patients buy it, there are no studies, and they can't see the results, we're lucky, we're done. And whereas basically if you tell a patient just not to rub their eyes, like that, 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 
I put mask over them at night because they rub at night. Um, it stops getting worse. <laughs> Cheap. Zero dollars down. But you know what? I look like the asshole because they go, he didn't treat me. I had a guy yesterday sent by a colleague, a specialist. Treat him. You don't need treatment. And he'll probably walk out, get a second opinion and have the treatment. Am I the mug? Sometimes I wonder. So here's something I want to put in your mind. We talk about evidence-based medicine. So we do a thousand people, company pays for it, prove their drug works. Evidence-based medicine, therefore it works for you and you and you individually, sure. What about science-based medicine? That is, are there scientific principles and is there a basis? The analogy I give you is, we've never ever proven a parachute works. Why? Because there are no controlled studies. In one arm, you have the parachute. You 10 will go without and we'll prove <laughs> if it works. That's evidence-based medicine. Science says we'll test it. It seems to work. Chuck a rock in it. Chuck a dummy in it. Okay, we'll do it from 100 feet. Okay, yeah, it seems to work fine. That's science-based medicine. And there's a difference. So what's happening is corporations are driving it. They profit. There's more doctors with less experience, less knowledge. They follow, the population follows, powered by social media. We aren't generating antibiotics. Too restricted, not enough profit. Companies making cancer drugs, no restrictions. Hey, it's the holy grail. Our Medicare budgets are being blown apart. My practice changed since, as Jeff said, social media, total change, unbelievable. The smartphone has killed it. We're at risk with our thinking because of the smartphone. And that idiot has actually proved it. Um, alternative facts. Honest yeah. to God. Yeah. Where did Kellyanne Conway come up with that? <coughs> YouTube her, watch her attacking Trump, how, how lack of credibility he has about a year ago. It's amazing to see it. Um, we label fake news, we label real news as fake, and no one knows where we are. Okay? Um, he's denying science, he's plunging us back, and it's powered by social media. He's reducing, who remembers the GFC? Well, guess what he's done? He's taken the financial controls back, he's wound them back. Really? Why? He's reducing pollution, he's reducing corporate tax, he's increasing corporate power, and he's increasing corporate control. Remember the Dark Ages? None of us were alive. The church ran that. Are we entering a corporate dark age? I know in science, I've got to be so cynical, unfortunately, not just skeptical, but cynical about the results. And this is really important, basically. Um, when technological powers are in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issue, when the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority, when clutching our crystals, just picture that, and nervously consulting our horoscopes. James Randi, wonderful story, cut up all the horoscopes, chucked them up in the air, picked one, published in the University Press and got all these, oh, thank you, you're just so accurate, you're predicting them. Our critical, he carried in his wallet a note that says, I'm going to die today. Just in case he died and people go, oh my God. <laughs> How did he know? <laughs> Our critical faculties in the decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide almost without noticing back into superstition and darkness and we are here now. And medicine is not excluded. <coughs> And corporations are running it. So, one other final point, and then I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> Why do we not put money? Everyone goes, oh, there's more education, more education. You know, it'll just endless. Everyone will go more. It's like that. You open the gates, the flood's still there. Open it more, it's still flooded. We've got a lot of education. Why don't we pour money into thinking? Why are we building computer thinking? and we're completely ignoring human thinking. Blissful ignorance. 
We think our thinking is perfect. I can think, you know, one plus one is two. I, I know how to think, sure. Alan de Botton wrote a book, um, Religion for Atheists, and it's not what you think. It's absolutely brilliant. And he points out the, the reminders that religion has, and they're brilliant. Why can't we have reminders about the, the good things that religion has? It works beautifully, and thinking. So in summary, we're people, we have poor thinking, we spread myths, and we're influenced by business. And that takes down your treatment. We should be promoting health, not disease. Oh, you know, we, need a, we need a disease group to go and promote this disease. So what happens? We go and spend our time telling everyone they're sick, and all the lunatics go around and tell everyone how to be healthy. Why aren't we in control of that? It's not just my thought. Watch the interview, Barack Obama, the exit interview with, with Bill Maher on YouTube. Right now, we've got a disease care system. We should have a health care system. Would include nutrition, exercise. For a long time, agribusiness had a prominent seat at the table in Congress. It's bipartisan. The strategy has to be one of persuasion. It has to make be more demand-driven. How to make consumers more aware they get the information they need. It's important to look at the science and the stuff. Figure out what's rice as best we can tell. Figure out what the science is. Figure out what the facts tell us. Once you figure it out, we then we'll write the politics. Don't start with the politics and try to get the facts to fit in. And then we've got Trump. Medical mythology is resilient, it's robust, it goes there, and we are the carriers of medical mythology, and we spread it. What do you do? Find facts first, fact check. Be very careful of the headlines. Be very careful. Any breakthrough you see, it's usually a university seeking grant funding or corporations seeking cap venture capital. Anything you see in the media, I don't care what it is, that's what's driving it. Um, cancer and vaccine news, just be careful. They don't happen overnight. That's absolute crap. Um, we have to question our data. We have to question everything. And we have to wear our statistical knowledge and our bias. But you can't control that for your doctor. So you have to basically question your doctor. And you have to feel, feel comfortable to say, why? Why am I having this treatment? Why do I have to come back? What is my diagnosis? How are you sure? What tests? What do they show? And that's all you can do. And you've got to follow your gut on the rest of it, make a gut decision. I wanted to get out by about quarter two. I think I've made it. So thank you very much for staying back and listening to me. I know that I hope I didn't bore you too much, but it's, uh, I found it really enjoyable to put that together. And I realized, as I said to you at the beginning, there are so many dimensions around it, there's no hope the general public can ever understand that. It took me so long to put that together. And I think I could give that 10 times and keep improving it. Um, but you just have to question, and you actually have to think and make a decision. And you know what? Um, it, the orthopedic surgeon that I showed you made a comment that most bone fractures will heal, yet most orthos I know will take you to surgery and put a pin in it, whereas you can just splint it. And that's a really telling thing that you, know, you can say to your doctor, will this heal? And you know what? A second opinion is always useful. Steve, back to you. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, it's refreshing to hear um, someone, unlike our pro former Prime Minister, who didn't know the difference between a repository and a suppository. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, they store both stores. That's because it I might suppose. be one. Um, thank you for showing us that, you know, there's religion and there's also alternative science, which means we both still die in 30 years old. Um, showing us that, her that, actually I was quite surprised by the logo that you showed, and that, that it's actually Hermes. There's actually a company called Hermes Precision, yeah. which sells you crap that you've talked about. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for showing us that, you know, that, um, you know, with Trump, with the health bureaucracy, with the tech companies, with money that's being poured down, it's not necessarily the best outcome. Um, I personally, in my time at the health, have witnessed that two babies have died and yet the minister hasn't resigned. So if that can happen, a lot of things can happen. So thank you so much for your time tonight. And um, uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thanks Steve for asking. <laughs> Ian Harris. Yeah. He's an orthopod at Liverpool. Yeah. That's the guy. You like him? 
look, he's he said things that needed to be said, and he's done some positive things. So, excuse me. Anthony, uh, just again, thank you very, very much for uh, putting all that work into it, and uh, and everybody really enjoyed it. Um, it's not often that uh, nobody disappears for a talk, and everybody stayed steadfast. Thank you very much. Has anyone got questions you want to ask? You, you could be here for a while. No, no, I'm happy to field. Go ahead. Did you? Uh, Okay. Do you mind if I tell you what I can? I'm, I'm not going to answer medical, I'm going to answer surgical. Sure. Yes, I treat some medical disease, but I'm going to answer surgical. A patient comes in my room and says, oh, I need the surgery. And I go, Yeah, you could have the surgery. I could do it, and I'm going to profit from it. I've got a financial incentive to say, Go ahead and have surgery, right? I tell that to my patients. Because you're going to pay me. I'm, I, know, you know, I will do some patients publicly. People come in the can't. Yeah, fine, I'm happy to do it. I use the Steve Jobs approach. If you get out of bed three days in a row and it's really killing you, okay, maybe you know, might want to think it through. My mate that I told you was a 38-year-old with a hip, I said to him, are you able to work? He goes, yeah, I feel like an old man, but you know. Three days in a row, if you can't cope it, take that first stage procedure, burr it off. Okay? Um, you want to do the minimal invasive for the best outcome. Yes, surgery is wonderful. It's a fantastic thing, but it's not a panacea. It works. I tell my patients, surgery works when? I have a patient that needs the surgery, that understands the benefits, that accepts the risks, that is willing to do what I tell them to do and wants the surgery. If you can meet all those criteria, you're going to do well. But if you go, oh, should I have surgery? Yeah, you need surgery also. If you don't do this, it's going to get, oh, oh shit, I better do it. They come and go, well, why did I have the surgery? And then when they have a complications of problems. So my answer to you surgically is, if you actually do need it and you feel it and you should know, then talk about that elective procedure. I have another theory that all elective surgery, all surgery is elective. All surgery. You walk out, don't take this the wrong way, you get mowed down by a bus in the street, your cognitive function's fine, you're in the gutter, all broken bones, and you say, I'm right, thanks, I just want to stay here. I don't have a right to pick you up. As long as you're cognitive functioning, you can have that choice. Sorry, go on. You asked me a question. Well, I was wondering if you got any tips to stay away from like science. From junk medical science? Well, well, like, you know, like, 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 the, you know, use a bit of medical science, like, um, you know, you were just talking about, like, you know, people speaking to the health or, you know, I would avoid all sorts of popular culture, social media based thing. You know, read sci New Scientist. You know, even Scientist the Americans probably not even as good as it used to be. Some of those things fine. But anything else, honestly, I think it's a complete waste of time. Read some philosophy. Seriously. Go and read go and read Socrates. I mean, it's amazing those guys, what they wrote and 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 you know idleness and how people just destroy themselves with their idleness. You don't have to pull your phone out and go, I better update myself. See if you can remember what you looked up on Monday. See if you can remember what you looked up yesterday. But why do you need to know? I think put your time and effort into critical thinking and rational thinking and you'll be able to solve any problem when you need to. I strongly believe that. Sorry. Well, we all have that. They're humans. I am exceed look, if, if you pick something up, the, the the real fundamental base science, the first thing is I want to know who's, who sponsored this this publication. Who sponsored it? If it's a drug company, okay, boom. My bullshit detector is so far up there. Okay? Even on PubMed. 
I don't care, even on PubMed, just because it's on PubMed doesn't mean it's good. You just gotta see who's pub, who has sponsored this study? And what other studies do they do? And secondly is, look, I've got no issue with research. Don't forget, Maxwell's equations were just artistic, wonderful equations that no one knew what the fuck to do with until we discovered radios. And it's like, oh my God, right? So all research is fine. The Ig Nobel Prize. How to partially unboil a boiled egg. Why would you do that research? I actually think, fascinating, somebody thought something different out of the box. It's completely useless <laughs> now, but that's probably good research. But anything with a financial bias, straight away I'm off. Second thing is, the fundamental science. Where is it duplicated? If it's a one-off study and they've got a P is less than 0.05, that doesn't, that's not proof. Okay, that's, that's the only way you can do it. Sorry, go, I'm, I'm, sorry, go ahead. Um, chiropractors. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, go. Should they really be called doctors? And, uh, uh, honestly, I think you're opening a can of words that I can't close for you. I'm not going to answer that insofar as I think alternative medicine, if it worked, would be called medicine. Go. Can you allude to the issue of statistical incompetence among doctors? Absolutely. The problem goes much deeper into research. Absolutely. Like I consider I have done my research, like I know you've got... You have, you, no, no, you have... It's irrelevant. They got to and they said the beta blockers cause prostate cancer. Yeah, and that's right. Statistical noise. So the problem is not just in social media, it's in the core medical journals as well. Absolutely. We have so much to answer for. Yeah. We have so much to answer for. We've created this nightmare. And industry takes it. My classic example is fat, the butter studies. Right? Everyone's in love fat. I believed it. Now I've spent the last two and a half years writing about this on a side, and you realise it's all crap. What did industry do? They got in there. They screwed it down. Do you know the health pyramid on food? Yeah. The, that has been made by industry. Right? It was a European idea, and in the US, the industry changed it to suit their needs. See, we're all screwed when it comes to this. And it can actually be simplified. There are ways to do it, which I'm working on to try and publish something. But the answer is you've just got to ask questions. And for most people, they're not going to be able to read papers like you do. Sorry, going down back. Moving on. So again. Do you know what? I have operated on mullahs, on religious people. I don't give a shit if you're religious, whatever. I respect that's fine. Okay? Hold on. I come, a patient comes to me <laughs> Thursday. I had a guy, and I walked in the theatre just before he was an anaesthetic. How are you? Know, you're here, you're fine. Remember what I told you? I'm here, you're here. Your agreement doesn't stop in this operating theatre, nor does mine. This is where I speak to my patient before surgery. You agree to be here, but you're going to agree to attend my appointments follow my instructions, take my medications. If you don't, you're gonna fuck, I don't say that, but you're gonna fuck up my data. <laughs> I don't want a failure and I just don't want you here. That's what I tell my patients. Now if somebody says I've got a religious problem with medications, okay, I've got no issue with that. But don't come to me to science and expect me to solve your religious problems. <laughs> if your religious problems dominate, ask your deity to fix it, okay? <laughs> But you're coming to me. You're in my domain. You want my help. My help does not stop here. And I tell you, we will walk through this together, hand in hand. I'm not doing this alone. I cannot do it without you. I need your help. You've got to do what I say. And if you're not going to do what I say, tell me now because I don't want to operate on you. That's how I deal with it.
you shouldn't be convincing anybody because it's not your role. You cannot convince anyone. You can only lead them to a conclusion. You cannot convince. Galileo said that long ago. You can only guide them. The Socratic method is about asking questions to guide them. You cannot convince them. They believe what they want to believe because they're convinced whichever way they want to be convinced. So I don't try and change anyone's mind. I just say, look, if you're not going to do what I say, fantastic. I actually go, there's the door. <laughs> they stay. They sign the consent form. They go to surgery. Go on, sorry. Versus what? Yeah, it's getting harder and harder to find. Sure. Absolutely, it's not not going away. I'm silently hopeful. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Whitlam era person. I got my education for free, sucked in, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I got mine for free. You know, yeah, he was terrible, he ran the company, blah, blah, blah. He gave us education, right? He gave us universities. We, had, we, we have, and for those of you of Asian descent, don't you love people go, I'm not racist, I'm not racist, but. <laughs> But the Asian countries are coming down here. I took my son to ANU, and I sat there and I went, all these guys straight from China off the plane, I go, mate, they're taking our education, they're building universities, and your kids are going to China to get educated. So what I'm getting at is we do need proper, non-fiscally driven research. I'm hopeful that somehow we'll go through this second dark age, <coughs> crash and burn, and if we survive, have proper science again. because. Everything that we have in this room, everything that you've eaten, everything, how we got here is completely science and technology based. And there's no way out of that. You just, it's the reality of it. So do I want a corporation directing my science and keeping me there? No, not at all. Is it going to happen? Yes. I won't see the end of that, but I'm just hopeful that we will have proper prestigious universities that will manage proper science. Go. Okay. The Lighthouse? Uh, the, uh, uh, the Lighthouse, I think it's Oh, Chris O'Brien Lighthouse. Yes, yep. uh, with a friend who was visiting a hematologist. And um, he paused briefly and said, oh, I just need to check uh, the research on this that I am, in fact, correct. Went off, pulled up PubMed, pulled up one paper, and then went, um, I'll just check for another one, because I think there's another paper on this. Yeah, sure. And went, check the two papers. And I was terribly impressed that he actually was talking about, oh, we're looking at sample size, and the success sure. rates and so on. I thought there was you know, some real critical thinking and evaluation. Absolutely, of and it of should be, and it and should I was be. terribly pleased to see that, but also made me think what training in the evaluation of these things is being done nowadays as part of the doctor's education process Not a lot. critical thinking. Not a lot. There's no training in critical thinking. There's no training in, I think if I were to train a medical student, it would be on critical thinking and, the, and our evolution. If you understand where you've come from, you'll understand where you're going. But we don't have either of those two things. <coughs> Sorry, go on. I was just very bored because generally I comment thoughts on psychiatry or science. Ah, uh, look, I um, I don't know why everyone's laughing. I got a DVD delivered to my office a couple of years ago, and it went, and I looked at it. And it looked so professional about psychiatry and psychology, and I looked it up, and it was some institute, and all. Oh, YouTube, I Googled it, and it was, of course, those Scientologist dickheads. Right? Um, you said psychiatry. Can I ask, is there any reason why you said psychiatry? Psychiatrists, yes. They are doctors. They're medically trained. Okay. Is your question, therefore, does it exist? Okay. 
Is your question that? Did I hear you correctly? Or did I interpret you correctly, I should say? Uh, 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 no, in a very general, uh, uh, it's not a question, but okay. general validity of... Can I, well then, let, let me answer it this way. It's, it's slightly, it's not a direct question, so let me answer it this way. There is something like 10 to the 40 odd neurons in your brain. We have evolved with a wiring pattern that's quite similar, you know. The fact that we're all in a room, in this room, is so abnormal, right? You think it's normal. No, it's fucking abnormal. Man lived in small clans and you showed up and I'm going to kill you. End of story, rape your wife, whatever, take all your goods. That's our brain. We've learned to think, to live in this room. We've learned to say, oh, it's my personal, you know, would you like to sit? We've learned that. The fact that we can live in societies, right? But every one of our brains and our connections is different. There is no reason why pathology is limited to what I can see. No reason. There is more connections in my brain than fucking planets in our solar system. Or, sorry, solar system, in our universe. Right? Don't tell me that there can't be micropathology there. Not for one second will I believe that. Now, the fact that I can't see it, and we're now starting to image it, there cannot be micropathology there because I can't see it. And I've got a lump on my arm. I go to the doctor. I lump my arm. Doctor goes, I've got to operate. Operate. Lump's gone. Oh, thanks, doc. I'm happy. I had a couple of chemicals misfiring in one of my nuclei in my brain. How do I know? How do I know? Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So these guys can demonstrate that chemical imbalance, can treat it, can manage it, can change it, right? But they can't put their finger on it and go, look here, now we've got functional MRI, we can start to demonstrate it. In the same way, and I'm going to shift sideways, psychology is absolutely amazing. It affects us all here. Those list of cognitive biases, go look them up, you'll be able to identify most of them. Except, I have a belief, personal belief, take it with a grain of salt, my guesstimate, 95% of psychologists are fucking crap, okay? But 5% and those put them and philosophers together, oh my God, they should be running our country. Sorry, somebody asked me a question. I'm sorry, I hope I answered that. I didn't give you a direct answer, you didn't give me a direct question. Yeah. Go on. I, I practice in surgery, right? And I deal with a lot of psychology. And I call it psychosurgery. That's what I call it, okay? But it's real. That psychology comes in, and I tell you what, I'm sitting there as their psychologist. And I tell them that. Sorry, any other questions? You've been, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop you one second. You have a system that we doctors tend to hate because it's a little bit more socialised. Yes. And, and I'm, I'll, I'll let you start in a minute. I just want to explain this. It's a little bit more socialised. We have Medicare and we're very lucky to have it. In the US, the paradox of the US, you turn 65 and it's all free, free, socialised. You can't bill Bill Gates if he walks in. You cannot no, bill him. Yeah. I know, and you're from Canada. Yeah. NHS is in England. I think it's a fantastic system. So you have a socialised form of medicine, more than we do. Go ahead.
don't fucking know. You can't take responsibility for what you don't know. I'll put you in a box and I'll tell you it's the sun and you're going to believe me. But you've been told that's normal. Where is your measure? Where's your yardstick of normality? The hardest thing I have, patient, what's normal, doc? I don't know, is my answer. I can tell you what abnormal is. Your normality is what you have in your social media and your phone. You don't know what's normal. No, we do know. No, no, I'm not, it's not an attack. Sure. And you're told there's a quick fix and ask your doctor of this, so why can't I have that too? There may be the answers for me once, shame on you. George Bush. Shame on me. No, not really. That's a total oversimplification. Your, pat your thinking is totally driven by your environment. If I raised you as a child to hold a gun and shoot every person that looked like this, you're going to believe that it was the right thing to do. If you're raised up and your phone from a childhood tells you to do this, if you're raised up, you will do it. I know you're nodding your head no, but 95% of the population will do it. And you watch them, they voted Trump in, they follow, they're told. Ra, 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 wonderful line I saw. And with that goes, that's the, we, we lose our liberty and to the sound of thunderous applause because you think it's right. And that history has shown that in humanity. That's the way we're That's how our brain is wired, and we'll follow. Go ahead. Do I think we are? I think there are a lot of groups of people like this, and the rest, you're going to be inundated by the reactionaries, the reactive thinkers, and you cannot fight that. I don't know how to change it, but the reactive thinkers are don't. Why does McDonald's have 1.5 million fucking followers on Instagram? Why do I need McDonald's to bloody message me every day? Seriously, come on. Go look it up if you don't believe it. So, no, I don't have a lot of hope unless we have a huge amount of regulations. All I can say to you is don't give your kids an iPhone or a bloody tablet. Go on. I don't, honestly, I don't think, I, I, I think that's an oversimplification. I think that you should judge the, each person on, on their merits and what they're like. I mean, he might have, that, have you been to a doctor's thing where it has a wall full of degrees? And if you look at him, he went to some piss fart thing on Sunday and then the next thing on the Monday and something else, and a certificate's on his wall. I think that's a sign of inadequacy, really. Um, I think a doctor can talk to his patient and explain it. You, you're lucky. That's, that's all I can say to you. Again. Okay, this will probably get me thrown out of the room, but can I just uh, caution people against the company delusion that Donald Trump is stupid? Mm. Oh, no, 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 no. I've studied his career in detail, I've read his books, and he did many bad things, but he's not stupid. He's a con man. He's a very clever con man. I'm sorry if I said he's stupid. He's a very clever con man. That's an interesting way of saying politician. No, it's not. It's not. Give me Barack Obama any day. He's a con man. He's very clever at cons. Yeah. We're dealing with some very serious issues here. He's a okay, he's a narcissistic psychopath and he's a sociopath, right? But he's also a con man and he's conned them. You know, the forgotten man. We'll fight for the forgotten man. Well, guess what? Who cares about the forgotten man? What do you do first? Take away women's rights, lower tax thresholds and screw over medical care. and put Betty DeVos in charge of education. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Yeah, Anthony, but thanks for a really uh, thought-provoking talk. Enjoyed it thoroughly. For people who are contemplating
taking surgery or they be told yeah. that they need to consider sure. surgery. And I think you touched on this briefly. How valuable do you think it is for them to see a second and a third yeah. opinion? And and if possible, to obtain an opinion from someone who has no financial interest in the surgery. Now I know it's difficult it's really to difficult. find such a I think, look, if I, know, if I know about surgery, what I do, I can advise you. If I have 10 operations, I'm not going to advise you about the 11th. Okay? Whatever's in my toolbox, I'll use. It's okay to do a Google search and look up, oh, well, tell me about this surgery. Why is this useful? And you've just got to go and beware, ask the questions. As soon as you get resistance, like I've had patients come and go, a doctor wouldn't answer my questions. I wouldn't go to a doctor that didn't answer my questions. Um, and you know what? You're going to make a choice that may not be optimal. You're going to have an outcome that may not be optimal. All I can say to you is, find out about it. Sure, do a Google search and find out. But please, you've got to go with a clinician you trust and are comfortable with. 10 opinions, 10 answers, Great confusion. Be very careful. It may be the same answer phrased differently mm. and therefore perceived. Perceived differently. As profoundly different. Mm. Sorry, go on. Yeah, look, I had, a, I had an incident where my eyes were very pressurized, you know what I mean? Glaucoma. That's right, that's correct. Now, um, getting on to what you said, my pressure was so high. That might be the case. Sorry? That might be the case. That was the case, yes. So he really is a, I had a hunch of things were wrong. So I went to the doctor and I trusted the doctor to tell me what had to be done and I agreed with that procedure and I'm glad I did. But that's the problem with having this idea that, that you must, you know, you, you've got to have some reasonable reason to have a second Second opinions can be problematic. Sure. It absolutely, it can be very difficult. There's no black and white there. I think we're going to have to close it, close it soon, or no, I'm keeping going, going, but go on.